Good evening. I'm Paul Rogers, Curator of Public Programs and Education at the Museum of Art and Design, Miami-Dade College. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Hislac Talks program in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Carlos Betancourt, The Body Remembers, a letter to Bartolome de la Casas, a conversation between Carlos Betancourt and Dr. Carol Damien. The Kislak Center is part of Miami-Dade College's special collections housed in the historic Freedom Tower. The Kislak Center collection is comprised of remarkable objects and artifacts that enlighten the history of the Americas, objects all of you should come and see. To learn more about the Kislak Center, go to moadmdc.org and follow the link to the special collections. And I should add right now, the collection is in temporary storage while the Freedom Tower is being refurbished, but there's plenty for you to explore about the uh, Kislak Center online. Carlos Betancourt is an award-winning artist residing in Miami, Florida. His work can be found in numerous museum collections, including the National Portrait Gallery, Washington, DC, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, the Perez Art Museum here in Miami, and the Museo de, de Arte de Ponce, Puerto Rico, among others. Dr. Carol Damien, curator of the Kislak Collection, is an art historian and former professor of art history in the School of Art and Art History at Florida International University and former director and chief curator of the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum at FIU. Please note, Mr. Betancourt and Dr. Damien will field questions from the audience, which you can submit by clicking the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Thank you and enjoy the talk. Dr. Damien. Thank you for joining us. The Kislak Collection has such extraordinary documents, maps, and objects. And I was really thrilled to find out that Carlos Betancourt was inspired by one of them, by Bartolome de las Casas, Entre los Remedios, the third tract. And that means that uh, he did actually, he wrote nine tracts. Like, they're like little uh, pamphlets. And um, beginning in 1516, and they were published in Sevilla in 1552. So we are really honored to have a first edition in our collection and to have an artist who really appreciates this particular document. So Carlos is, um, as Paul said, an artist, a Miami artist born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And he is going to talk to us about how this extraordinary manuscript book inspired him. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction to Bartolome de las Casas. He was a landowner, a friar, and a priest. And he is considered the defender of the Indians because it was in his publications that he described the atrocities committed by the colonizers against the indigenous peoples. So my question to Carlos has been, why did Bartolome de las Casas inspire you, especially in this very notable book that he writes this letter to the king? And you have taken this letter and done something quite extraordinary. You have written your letter to Bartolome de las Casas. So can you talk to us a little bit about how and why it inspires you. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Paul, and uh, thank you, Carol, for this uh, introduction and for inviting me to these talks. Um, and Carol, thank you for this journey with you for so many decades. Uh, you have helped me to find my voice, and I, see, I say that from the bottom of my heart, and uh, help me understand my artwork, artwork as well, especially when I work so strongly with the visual image and I trust it. But you have helped me to uh, put words into it, which is uh, a very difficult task for many artists. 
So, um, why De Las Casas? I think um, through my upbringing in Puerto Rico, somehow everything led to Las Casas when I was asking cultural questions. Uh, I grew up listening to uh, what I thought was myth about the, uh, um, the cacique uh, chief things of uh, Puerto Rico, of Cuba, the Caribbean, like Siboney, Anacaona, Loisa. And I thought the stories I heard of them were just pure mythology. And as I, as I grew up older, I found out that actually there was an account, a personal account on someone that was physically there in front of these uh, caciques and documented their existence, literally documented their words. So I said that all, all roads uh, led to uh, Bartolomé as I was growing up. I, um, when I was old enough to have a, a, a document or the book of my hand of the destruction of the Indies, and I read uh, plenty about it, I was really taken by the presence of this man uh, that went there as a, as a, with a, a point of view that quickly changed as, as he saw the atrocities committed against the, the indigenous people of the, of the Americas. I, I, if you know a little bit about my work, I always believe that art should be informed by one's own experiences, what's right in front of you. And Bartolomé's document, literally, it, that's what it is. He archived and documented was, what was right in front of him. And I, that's what I tried to do with my work. Um, with Bartolomé also helped me to embrace my own culture, embrace my own reality, what's in the past, where I come from. I think, and I think Carol, you and I have talked vastly about this, is the only way that you could be honest with your artwork. So finding this manuscript years in the Kislak Foundation, it triggered that search uh, that led me to define and to understand my artwork and my uniqueness, literally to find my voice. It's very important, I, I want to say, that moment uh, that I reached to uh, the Kislak Foundation decades ago. It was located, I think it was in Miami Lakes, thanks to Arthur Dunkelman that took me there. Uh, to see this, this uh, manuscript that you just uh, mentioned, I was working, I was volunteering with the Miami Circle. And it is one of those moments, I don't know for some of you that may be familiar with it or not, it's an archeological site in downtown Miami. I literally jumped a fence to uh, volunteer in this place. I did something illegal. Bob Carr, the main archaeologist for the city of Miami, came like running towards me. He's like, you can do that. You can jump that fence. Uh, that's illegal. And I introduced myself. I said, all I wanted to do was, was be part of this exploration uh, in downtown Miami. I wanted to get my hands immersed. I wanted to touch the past of Miami, something that I think is very difficult to do. Um, and they allowed me to immediately, within half an hour, I was sifting through the oolite and finding Spanish artifacts and eventually Tequesta artifacts. I say this because this is the same time when I have to run literally to the Kislak Foundation and touch something else, which is this manuscript. I really, when I was living in Miami for a very long time, coming from such, such a strong culture in, in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean, is so defined by our by our cultural heritage, be it European and at the same time indigenous, the Taino culture is so rich in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, I found myself very lost in Miami, not understanding really what was Miami about or what was its history. All that prevailed was pop culture. And, uh, and it was at that moment that I wanted to make a connection between where I was coming from, the Caribbean basin and Miami. So once I immersed myself in that Miami circle with Bob Carr, got my hands dirty, started touching literally with my hands. And I said that in a very physical and romantic way, these objects, uh, I was able to go to the Kislak Foundation, which I had no clue it existed in Miami with some of the most treasured uh, objects for me right up in my backyard. And I had a feast. Uh, Immediately, I started finding the connection with the 
European settlers and conquistadors of uh, Florida. I made a connection with uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, thanks to this manuscript, I started understanding that there was a connection uh, with Florida as well, with Ponce de Leon, for better or worse, and, uh, and Puerto Rico. Ponce de Leon was the first uh, governor of Puerto Rico. Ponce de Leon died in Florida. And it was important to me to to touch this document, uh, it's important for me to see the actual physical objects. And uh, the Kislak collection was instrumental for me in this part of the world. Puerto Rico has a, a great museums and I was able to really see firsthand a lot of Taino artifacts. The Tainos being the indigenous people that welcomed Christopher Columbus in the Caribbean for those of you that are not familiar. I think I may have touched too long in this question, but uh, <laughs> it is an important question. And that's how I came along, uh, Bartolome, no? Mm -hmm. So let's go on to this work, which you call who the um, letter to Aracoa. Who is she? And why did you write a letter to her? And how does it relate to Bartolome de las Casas? Well, uh, I mentioned earlier that Bartolome talked uh, uh, wrote, wrote a lot about uh, Taino culture. He mentioned uh, Anacaona, uh, which was uh, a, a cacique uh, chief. Uh, I eventually found out about other women that were very uh, strong and, and, and leaders in Taino culture. I think he also mentioned Loisa. Uh, so uh, I found out that Taino culture is a very, uh, it's a matriarchal society. And I grew up surrounded by very strong women. Actually, uh, we call them macheteras, like, you know, Latin women are very strong leaders. And so those are the, these are the, this is how I grew up surrounded by, in a way, and I tend to romanticize a lot this, by a, a matriarchal society around me in Puerto Rico. My father was also a very strong figure. And if you, some of you may know my mother, you know how strong that lady is. Um, so I used her here. Uh, I used my grandmother in my hand. That's a picture of her. That is Aracoel. Aracoel in Taino means grandmother. Uh, for, for use of another word, I thought it was very poetic to find out, like many other cultures, that the Taino uh, people had a word for grandmother. And through that, I, through using my grandmother as a vehicle, I ride her in my body, the body being the last frontier between me and the outside world. I, when I did this series many years ago, and many of this work, that is the precedent. That's what I was writing in the world. This is my internal world. Your world starts over there. Mine ends here in my skin, at least physically. Um, so I use that as a, um, almost like a sacred canvas, no? I write backwards to my grandmother and I write to Bartolome backwards are, as well as a way to communicating with the other side. This I learned from some other cultures. I come from a very mixed culture, uh, Afro-Caribbean, European, of course, and the indigenous tribe. So when you write backwards, it's actually it's like a mirror image. It's also very difficult to read and uh, I do that as a way of, I almost want you to know what I wrote on my body, but I also don't want to. It's my sacred place. It's my sacred world. When I find out about the word Aracoel, I also, I was guided through that word. It's like, well, I want to know what other words uh, Bartolome wrote about or what other words are there on record. Aracoel kind of didn't make made it to the Lexington, the universal words, but there's other Taino words that made it which makes me think that the culture at least has some power in words. One of those words is huracán, hurricane, which translates into English and Spanish. Another one of the Taino words, according to my research, and mind you, it's very difficult to do research nowadays, right, Carol? One book contradicts the other. So uh, the word hammock, for example, is amaca. It's another Taino word that we use in several languages. So sometimes we're using, we're connecting to this world that 
Bartolomé helped preserve. By the way, when you mentioned that he was the, the protector of the, of the indigenous people, he was actually paid a salary for being the protector of the indigenous people, which is, 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 is pretty great. Not mm -hmm. to me, I mean, goes against all the battles that he had, but he, he fought the battle all the way to, to the end. And that's why I have this great, in a way, the, the, what he left with us, this, this really, uh, this culture that mixes and, blending and blends all the time, and yet it's so defined in the mm -hmm. Caribbean and Mexico City, many other places. So that's, that's what you have there. And I used uh, my grandmother, which was such a powerful force in my life, I use her as a vehicle. That's so, what oil is right there on my head. <laughs> so in this one, I assume that you're you're kind of going in the same direction with the letter with the words backwards that you paint on your on your face and your arms and I imagine your whole body in this. And then this huge image, you're upside down. What what is the meaning of the upside down image when you put yourself upside down? Well, it's, uh, uh, it has, uh, I use a lot of symbolism in my work, so it has different connotations for me. It's a, it's a, it's a, when you put your, your head upside down, it's a symbol of crisis. It's a symbol of, of uh, misfortune. Uh, and, and that's what I'm, communicating here to Bartolomé. Actually, the name of this artwork is Self-Portrait with Letter to Bartolomé de las Casas. It's also inspired by a, a, a great artwork by the late Arnaldo Roche, which was called Dreaming in Blue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the meaning of the upside down head. Now, the tongue also has some meanings for, for, for uh, uh, many different cultures. For the Maori culture, it's ferocity and defiance. When I was doing this work, the, the word defiance was very important to me because Mar Bartolomé basically def was defiance against uh, the conquistadors, against many, many, many people that were against him publishing uh, these manuscripts. Uh, as you know, there were many people that uh, were surprised. I had no clue about the horrors that the conquistadors were uh, placing on, on the indigenous cultures, but a lot of people didn't want this manuscript to, to go out either because they own land from priest to uh, nobility. Uh, what I find very impressive about that is that, I mean, this manuscript came out very, you know, a couple of decades, but pretty close to the, to the conquest of the, of the new world. And yet people were, quite, um, what can I say? I, I, I always see, uh, say that good and evil exists in all cultures, all religions, or, or all races, no? And when this manuscript came out, you really like take sides and people started defining themselves in which side they are. I mean, to this day, we, st we still commit atrocities, no? This wasn't endemic to, to uh, to Spanish culture, uh, but it was also used against them, the, the way uh, the black plaid, Caroline, you may want to talk a little bit about that. The black, I'm sorry, the black legend. Black legend. Um, maybe you want to speak a little bit about that because this piece has to do a lot with that. Well, the idea that uh, when the word got back about what the Spaniards were doing, then they were really castigated for it. It became um, uh, something that was unbelievable at the time. And um, so the legend that arrives around that is about the history of colonization and conquest at that particular time. And Bartolome de los Casas was delivering the message. Correct. And then, so basically what he was doing was placing a uh... Uh, uh, the horrors of, of the Spaniards in uh, limiting, limiting it all to the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Very few times, and here we go, uh, uh, how someone can also, while trying to get the message across, can manipulate the present. He hardly mentioned the horrors that the Germans did in South America. He didn't mention it, or the Portuguese. 
he was very focused on the Spaniards uh, because he was Spaniard, he was a Spaniard. But then these uh, countries like Portu uh, Portugal, even the British that were also colonizing and, and creating horrors, they used this manuscript uh, to say, well, look what the Spaniards are doing. We are not doing that, we're much better. Well, that wasn't true. That was actually the black legend. The mm -hmm. other nations were using this, like saying, we're good, they're bad. Right. The, the, actually, the reality was that these countries didn't have someone like Bartolomé to talk about it. There's no Bartolomé de las Casas that came from, from the British uh, Empire or from Portugal. No one really wrote about it. That's the beauty of, of uh, Bartolomé. By the way, these books became bestsellers immediately. I went translated into hundreds of languages in, mm -hmm. in real time. Um, just to end on this image here, I think it also represents a little bit of, of what I inherited from my ancestors. Uh, when I say that this work is inspired uh, by Arnaldo Roche's Dreaming in Blue, Arnaldo Roche explains in that particular work how his mestizo heritage, and if you have green eyes, blue eyes, uh, where that comes from and the mixtures and the, and the, and, and the different uh, physical characteristics that come from the Caribbean. And that's what I play with that as well. If you have time to search that work and put it next to this, um, they have a lot in common. It's, it's, it's been a struggle for me also how to, how to, how to uh, marry this, the, the past and the ancestry of, of the land that I was born into with the present. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I have traveled so vastly and I talked to, to Carol about this as well, in search of my voice, I've been to, to Africa, I've been to Egypt, I've been to the Cunayal in Panama, I've been to uh, the Canary Islands where my last name comes from, co conquistadors that conquered the Canary Islands, Jean de Betancourt. Um, I, um, I, I struggle to really uh, put my place in a position that I feel comfortable with, my European ancestry, as well as my, my indigenous ancestry that I hope I have somewhere. I can figure it out because I never knew my grandfather, he disappeared, so I don't know much from my mother's, my mother's side. Um, but I, I was able to solve that and, and it takes years like I talked with Carol about it a couple of days ago, you have to do a lot of homework. It's not just reading this work, a lot of research uh, to really find your, your voice and feel comfortable and move forward, no, and own it. And it took me a lot of, uh, it was very expensive to go to these places and find my roots, find where I belong, but I have moved uh, forward and I have found other places that I belong to and I like, like Greece and Mexico, for example, because now I know so certain about my past. When I, when I moved to Florida, I thought the first thing I should do was get to know Florida. And it was very difficult because to get to know, unfortunately, most places in the United States, it comes through television, it comes through pop culture. The Kislak Center offers this marriage to the to the past that is concrete, solid, and historical. I, I'm a history freak, so I enjoy this. And that's the way I was able to connect to this land um, and understand it much better, no? So when I look at this, and I'm gonna bring the next one up too, this language that you're talking about is also rooted in symbolism that comes from, perhaps it's the symbols that are the communicators to you to go back into your past, to understand what the symbols meant then, and you're bringing them up to the present. And I think that's a very key topic uh, in all of your work. How are you taking your past, your roots, your identity, and interpreting that for the present, because you're an artist working today, you're a very contemporary artist, but the, the symbolism, what do these symbols mean to you and how do you use them? Well, I, I come from a very syncretic culture. Everything uh, mixes and blends, and that's what I try to do here. I, I, definitely, I work in symbolism. I, I develop my own 
alphabet with my own symbols. I study a Drinka symbolism from Africa. Uh, we actually have some land in Puerto Rico surrounded by, uh, by Taino hieroglyphs. I use them, yes, uh, you're right. And you help me understand my work like that because I do work in the ultimately in the visual image. So I use the symbol as a way of communicating with the past. Uh, that is basically the, my artist statement. I take the past and I present it in a new context. No, mm -hmm. I need that continuity. I need to be connected to enjoy my life, to feel comfortable in my life and to get old. So mm -hmm. I do that with, uh, with these uh, connections. Um, in this case in particular, I used a Hopi Indian spiral symbol. I believe it was Hopi Indian which was used as a way to connect, uh, to conquer the four corners. It's part of the, of the Hopi Indian lore. And they used to put this spiral in the rocks. But I made my own symbol. If you see the three little ribs closer to my face, uh, those are from Taino culture. And they also are found in a Dinkra culture and a Ja culture. They're actual ribs. For me, they signify ribs. No, Anna Mendieta worked a lot with this. It's someone else that during this period, I was very connected with her because she, was, she had a longing, longing to, to belong somewhere. Like it happens a lot uh, when you have an exile condition, no? So here I also have um, this, I guess it should have started with the title of the artwork. It's <laughs> called The Worshipping of, of My Ancestors. And I have my grandmother's ashes in my hand and I'm mixing them here with glitter as a way of activating it. The glitter is also symbolic of a Western African culture. And that's where the syncretism of my culture that has been mixing and blending forever. And, and, and it's part of how, of my thought process. Um, I think, uh, and there is some writing in here as well. Yeah, symbols and I. <laughs> and symbols, not only on your body, but this is another extraordinary image with the writing and the symbols. And so can you identify her and why you've included her in your work? What, what is the meaning behind these, these images? Sure. This work is, is also from that period. I, if I'm not wrong, I think it's titled, What are the names of your brother, Caracoel? So the subject actually is, uh, is the uh, ex-wife, but I do think they married again, of a dear friend that was pregnant at the time. And here goes back to, the, to all I've learned through, through uh, Bartolome. And of course, Bartolome takes me to other research uh, that is activated uh, through the Kislak Center, the, the matriarchal aspect of, of the Taino culture. And uh, so I use her as that symbol and she's pregnant. And in my romantic imagination, she's pregnant with twins. Uh, she's pregnant with twins because the mythology of the creation of the Taino people is based on these twins. Uh, and I, I ask in this series to Bartolome, what are the names of your brothers? Aracoel. Aracoel is the subject here because through all my research, I haven't, I have never found out the names of this deity that was part of the creation of, uh, of the Taino people. So I, I asked Bartolome, do you know, do you ever know the name? And then I go and elaborate no, on, the, on the idea of, of uh, matriarchal society. I think this piece of one from this series is a Pam, it is one of these that I, I, I believe Dennis Shaw donated it many years ago. I think it's the portrait of the single lady that it's in the permanent collection there. She's holding a, a copy of a, of a segment of Bartolomé's uh, document that you have there on the hand. And then on the right, that is an Adinkra symbol of, of Western Africa and I think it's very interesting how, how Bartolome starts taking me, it's a parallel between us as, as, as some of the, of the laws that he was able to pass to preserve the American culture, I'm sorry, the indigenous uh, people's culture, 
there's no other direction but to a mix, no? And, and that starts happening with my words, start accepting my, my uh, like I like to say, I mean, may sound, I may repeat it, the mixing and blending of my culture. Those are words that Robert Ferris Thompson used on my work once and I'll never forget. So you see these, uh, using symbols, not only I'm using Western African symbols in a, in a Taino indigenous theme artwork, and it's fine. I am obsessed with syncretisms. I, 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 I love the, the mixing in my culture, as long as these cultures remain very defined. I'm not like, uh, uh, I have issues with, uh, the melting pot theory, as we talked about in the past, I have issues with uh, basically erasing all cultures and, and ending up like a CVS, cold, with no sense of identity. I was saying to Carl the other day, that CVS that I go to that I have is sterile. It's in the, it, the middle of Little Haiti. It should be loaded with culture from Little Haiti or, or Cubans from that area. I don't know. So I... I I understand multiculturalism, but I need to have a definition, clear definitions around me. It is what I, it is what I uh, follow, no? And it is the places that I travel to uh, because they give me that. It's difficult to find it here, but thanks to, to these documents that are here now, I hope they don't leave. Uh, we have more definition of our own history. Mm -hmm. So speaking of um, symbols and nature, that certainly is significant to the image of the woman, the pregnant woman and the source of, of creation. I know you've done a lot of work actually in the land, in nature. So what is this? Did you place that symbol? Is that stone? Where is yes. it? That is stone and that is in the jungles of Puerto Rico. It's a place called Caguama, which is where the Taino uh, people used to play. It's a playing field. So I basically, again, took a, a Western African symbol and I placed it in, the, in a rock. The, uh, the symbolism here, you basically can escape because that symbol of Adinkra, it means defiance against, it means endurance. All this research goes behind my work, believe it or not. I know ultimately what we take is a visual image. So for the Western African uh, people, that symbol means endurance. And I go and, uh, and defiance, which is what Bartolome did. So I placed it on the land of the Tainos and I placed it in a rock, solid and strong. Yeah. And that's pretty much what's behind this work. I, it's one of those places that I... I enjoy going uh, many times because I connect. I need to connect. I need to connect with the physical uh, place. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I like going to, uh, I went to see, I uh, went to Luxor. I needed to be uh, in the Valley of the Kings, down there in Tutankhamun stone. I, <laughs> I, it's the explorer in me. And that's also a part of how I sometimes can romanticize the past, you know, which bring me to one thing that I also like to say, talking about the past. And we're very confused sometimes in this country because we're such a futurist uh, uh, mentality here that we think all the time, uh, well, what's next, what's next? Uh, I like to say that not everything new is great and not everything old is bad. We're constantly consumed with, uh, for example, in my case, you have an art exhibit and during your art exhibit, your opening, someone approaches you not to create any harm, but it's just a part of the culture. It's like, well, when, when is your next show? When is this? It's like, well, or you, you win an Academy Award and what's your next movie? <laughs> I think we have to focus more on the present, no? Uh, because we, we, we so miss it and a little bit of it in the past as well. I have to really make the effort to educate ourselves with what happened uh, before us, the good and the bad, and the bad to be informed, to make uh, better decisions. But well, we cannot concentrate, like I, I had an exhibit that was called the future eternal, that is the state of mind, that in this part of the world, in this country in particular, we are permanently thinking of the future. 
So uh, that's why I think I explore the past and I have so much respect for it. Every time I hear the word change, for example, I'm like, well, define change for me. Uh, uh, change, we need change, we need change. Well, an atomic bomb was change. Hitler was change. I need a definition of change to see if I like your point of view or I don't. But change, for the sake of change, uh, no, I, I need research. Mm -hmm. I need research. What kind of change are you talking about? Changing of uh, conquering a world and, uh, and killing the indigenous people? Or I, I don't know. Please explain. So I'm very careful with what I hear. I'm very careful with what, what I absorb and how I use the past in a new context. These works, uh, most of my works up to the present, the one behind me, I don't know if you can see, heavily researched, but it has to come natural and organic. I really profoundly believe that you have to be as truthful other way, otherwise, otherwise it shows in your work. It's how I collect art. I always, this place is surrounded by, unfortunately you can see, but I connect with someone else's artwork because you can help people see the authenticity of the artist behind. And I hope some of you can see that in my work, no? Mm -hmm. so, so much I can talk about one artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm still looking at this. Um, so this is an ancient ball court. Oh, yes. Oh, and yeah. I'm sure that many people don't know how old the ball game is and that Puerto Rico and Mexico, Santo Domingo are locations where the ball court is 2000 years old. And so we're talking about the past and respect for the past and research. We think of the ball game as today. This is all kinds of ball games and that, yeah, people have been playing with balls for many years, but the idea of a, uh, an actual organized game with obviously they've had to have rules and um, there's lots of theories about exactly what happened in these ballparks. But um, it's, it's very interesting to me that you choose this location to make a statement about the past mm -hmm. that is really very current. I mean, this- And, and this is what I talk why I need a Carol Damien in my life. <laughs> you help me complete what's in my head. I trust what's in my mind, no, uh, my research. And, and sometimes, and I think the surrealist said this, that I don't understand my work immediately doesn't, under, doesn't mean that I'm not gonna understand it in the future. Mm -hmm. I trust it, I trust the energy. I like to say, like my friend Alejandra says, I like to download directly from the source. Like Keith Haring once says, the primitive will always make us new. Mm -hmm. I take that as once you find your source, the possibilities are infinite. Every time you go back in literally to indigenous places like this, some porthole opens and you start downloading information. Uh, but for that to happen, you have to be there. Uh, and I truly believe in that. That has helped me a lot through my work to trust it and to trust the intuition and to trust the, the journey. I like my work. I like my work <laughs> a lot. But that's that's really wonderful. One little aside before we move on, within the fantastic objects and material of the Kislak collection, we have a significant amount of ball game material, and it was part of our uh, original installation, and it will be part of the next installation when we open again. Uh, that uh, talks about the ancient ball game and uh, all the paraphernalia associated with oh. it. So I just, I had, that's just my little plug for Kislak. No, I'll so. give you another plug as well. <laughs> I'll give you a little, another little plug. You have, and that's, this takes us to another country that I love, that is Mexico. You have mm -hmm. the first uh, printed map of Tenochtitlan, mm -hmm. uh, yes. which is Mexico City, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. Cortes- uh, The capital. Destroyed. And that was another one of the manuscripts that just mind boggling. That is a pretty uh, a historical document. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I talk about uh, even the accuracy of, of Bartolomé's writing, there's a very interesting fact that he, he avoided to talk about the thousands and thousands of, of, of uh, indigenous people that helped Cortés uh, conquer uh, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. Without those people, 
most historians agree Cortes which would, would have never, never, never uh, uh, conquered uh, Tenochtitlan. And mm -hmm. I do understand, uh, uh, for better or worse, that all tribes and cultures try to conquer each other, even indigenous people. That's how some people ended up in Teotihuacan. This is how the Caribe, the Caribbean Indians ended up taking over the islands uh, east of Puerto Rico by, by literally killing the Taino people. Uh, Bartolomé avoided mentioning um, a lot of the, of the atrocities also committed by the natives in their rituals, the, the cannibals that the Caribbeans were, the Caribbean the Carib Indians were, the word comes from there, because the picture, I mean, the, the, the horrors of the Spaniards were so, in my humble opinion, was so much more monumental. And for him to be able to carry the, me the message, he had to, in a way, uh, avoid those subjects. But research takes you to these places, which again, like you and I are fascinated by research. We have to have all the facts, facts in front of us, no? As many as we can. Exactly, exactly. And the same thing is true of the, the Inca. When Pizarro entered Peru, or what we now call Peru, he was helped by the fact that the Incas were in chaos. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. it, there's, there's a history behind the history. And that map that is at the Kislak, mm -hmm. I have been uh, fascinated by decades of the description of the Europeans coming into Tenochtitlan in Mexico City, because th this is, mind you, think about this, this is almost the Renaissance in Europe, yet they mm -hmm. arrive, and these cities are quite beautiful in Europe, and they describe it literally, no eyes have ever seen such a more beautiful city than Tenochtitlan. Mm -hmm. The gardens, the markets, how clean it was, the decorations. As a matter of fact, uh, most historians think that one of the reasons why um, Montezuma uh, did not fight so much uh, Cortes at the beginning was because he didn't want to destroy his beautiful, beautiful city. Your map at the Kislak, sorry, <laughs> I wish it was yours. I wish it was mine. <laughs> and you can lend it to me. Your <laughs> map shows the canals, so it shows the shape of this monumental city surrounded by canals that at one point it would shut down so no one can come in. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's really uh, magnificent that, that the kids like owns that. Mm -hmm. So, so let's very... move on to you in the landscape again. Where are you? And, and here we're talking about water. We're talking about canals. We're talking about water in oh, this particular good. image. You. Yeah, and there you go. You can really read my work. So and we really <laughs> haven't discussed this for, for anybody out there, this work before. So I work with here, I'm like in the warm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking again about the matriarchal society. I'm in a position, a humble position, almost like a fatal position. This work is informed also by another artist that was inspired a lot by her roots, which is Anna Mendieta as well. And uh, I am in the source. This is, this actually is in our land before we purchased this land for, to protect it for as long as we're around here. So um, I have to go to the source. I have to touch it. I need to belong to it to kind of like activate my, my creativity. And uh, so I can move forward. So that's, that's where I'm at. If there's a, I am not sure if this indentation on this massive rock uh, is, was created uh, by uh, the Taino people because they are Taino petroglyphs in the other side. It's, it looks to me very man-made, but then a lot of things in nature can fool you, but I take it like a warm and and uh, and I'll go in there and 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 connect. So, back to symbols and syncretism and uh, what how you work on really a grand scale <laughs> for some of these projects. Uh, so these are really quite different from uh, what we've seen. And uh, can you talk about them and also the materials? You can tell by the, the beach that this is huge, right? Yeah. Both of them are very, very large projects, installations. 
Uh, yes, this is actually as large as a, as a football field. I believe it was 300 by feet. I don't remember the exact dimensions. It was executed in the vernal equinox in I think 2001, 2002. That's the sun coming up during the vernal equinox. As you, some of you may predict, it's informed by the Nazca symbols in a way. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, informed by the crop circle apparitions. Uh, it, at the time, it's composed of hundreds and hundreds of elements cut out of wood some of them from my own alphabet that I created, but a lot uh, uh, borrowed from uh, the uh, pre-Columbian cultures. And it was installed in Miami Beach during an, an art basel. And you literally, you literally could uh, walk through it, uh, jog through it. It was, uh, it, we had an event on the vernal equinox with uh, two, two poets, uh, Campbell McGrath, of the, the, he had a MacArthur Fellowship and inaugural poet Richard Blanco read and participated. It was kind of a multidisciplinary event. If uh, from what I have talked, you can probably already identify the ribs on the center. And what mm -hmm. I'm working in here is with this symbol that kind of like completes me. It's the feminine on one side and the masculine in the other. It is a symbol that I came up with, uh, with my inventing my own syncretic culture, my own uh, world. I had, I think maybe like, uh, 50 volunteers that helped me do this in a period of, in one, of one year and it was uh, installed and it existed only for one day. <laughs> wow. And, uh, I wanted to have the ephemeral quality of that because of the ephemeral quality of life. Uh, it, it deals uh, again with syncretic cultures, what I inherited from the people that welcomed Bartolome and, uh, and what I have inherited and what I've tagged along, you know, trail behind me as I move around the world, no? The piece, I think it's important to mention and you talk about the, the magnitude of it. I was a volunteer when Christo did the Surrounded Islands and I was a young kid. I was a senior, I believe in 1983. I had moved two years before from Puerto Rico and I volunteered uh, with Christo Surrounded Islands when he was doing that massive project on the Bay and I'll never forget the, the freedom, the sense of freedom I had when you see, when you, I saw this, the construction of this work and the execution of it, and that you can actually get away by doing something like that with art mm -hmm. and all the definition that it had behind. I remember thinking how beautiful Miami was because an artist made me see that. As I grew up older, I understood that this artist named Christo and Jean Claude, sorry, I forgot to mention her, they used Miami as a muse. And I wanted to do this now, uh, uh, many years later. I, I remember Christo's and Jean Claude's work guided me mentally through this work. And, and uh, I always have him, and, and, and I'm very grateful for him. And I think Miami should be very grateful for him to help us understand uh, and see uh, the beauty and the culture that's around Miami. Mm -hmm. Nature. Nature. Right. And Miami as a muse. <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose this as our final slide because there's so much going on with this work that to me sums up everything that you've been talking about. Um, so explain. The complexities of it and why Thank why you. did you do this and again always uh, impressed by your talent and your research when you <laughs> presented me with with the order of the slides and i saw this <laughs> at the end which is like it's like 15 years later from everything else we have seen because the last slide was in 2001 so some uh thank you yes uh, this piece is called uh amulet for lights and you can see probably that the, the inspiration in uh, totemic shapes, no? Mm -hmm. And this piece is mostly inspired by Wilfredo Lam, the jungle, uh, the uh, Afro-Cuban artist, who was very important to me, his work, because as I was growing up, I thought he embodied everything that was Caribbean. He was able to put uh, Taino culture, 
European culture, Western African culture, all in one with his artwork, especially the jungle that is at MoMA. And uh, I, I thought it was very telling for you to end up with this because what have I inherited from, from this path and what has the European left us uh, culturally, or like I like to romanticize sometimes as well, like I said earlier, is this for me. Uh, um, this image, uh, this is my uh, Wilfredo Lamb's The Jungle. And what I want to tell you about about my what moves me and and the shape and forms that are in my head is this you know uh, we can try to put words and, and and meanings into this which most most of us attempt to i think as artists we have to learn how to defend our work and talk about it but at the end uh i'm a visual artist what i want to communicate and tell you is through the is through a visual image and i think this uh speaks about that, at least it speaks back to me, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. It's composed of hundreds of um, heirlooms from a collection of, an, of a friend of mine, a collector actually, that is in San Antonio, Texas. He lives in a ranch that once uh, belongs to uh, uh, Spanish settlers, and his family has been collected objects uh, for three, 400 years. And he, the, the, again, talking about the past and connecting the past to the present, and every generation adds something else to the heirloom. The artwork mm -hmm. is loaded with symbolism. These are actually, I cut the heirlooms in half and I mirror them as a way of communicating again with the other side. You will find that even in my most contemporary work as mm -hmm. uh, there's always a connection to uh, either Western African culture, and I like to say Western African culture because most of the slave and the Yoruba and the Bakongo were from that side of Africa that came into this side of the new world. And uh, I, you will, I, I like to stay connected like that. I like my artwork to, to feel like a living thing mm -hmm. that is possessed by, by life, uh, by a living culture. And I've heard that. I heard that sometimes. And I'm like, hey, what's in my head is reflecting. I heard people say, oh, I think your work is like alive. It's, it's living. It's a living thing. No? So the, the slide on the left, those are actual objects. Yes. I have a fascination of objects, but I think that's another talk. <laughs> it's, the absence, it's the absence of them when I was growing up economically, no? And, uh, and I also give the merits. I mean, we talk a lot about consumerism and, and well, we, should we create more? I mean, tell mm -hmm. that to an artist, it's, uh, it's, it's conflicting, no? If I had the chance to create something new, uh, am I not gonna give that to a new generation? But of course we need to be aware and conscious of what we're doing. I, I, I'm an object person. There's a piece of mine that is a shopping cart, and I read several essays about it, how it's a statement in consumerism and the waste. And for me, the actual piece was a celebration of objects mm -hmm. and the memory that is embedded in them and what, and what they activate. I mean, the necklaces that I have, they're objects. But hey, what they mean to me is very powerful from the one I inherited from my grandmother to this one that is from uh, Afro, from another culture and uh, and I'm protecting them, no? Wonderful. So we're coming to the end of our time and I am gonna ask the question that you don't want me to ask. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> really, really, really. Really? <laughs> What's next? I am going to have a glass of uh, tequila with soda and three limes. <laughs> um, I always do after I do this talk. So when I did my tech <laughs> talk, uh, it is, uh, as you know, for artists, it is uh, exhausting to make the connection visually and with words. But besides that, I'm working in, a, in an installation uh, in Espanola way and collaborating mm -hmm. with Alberto La Torre and, and the and art in public places. I'm, I'm building around 250 sculptural elements in Oaxaca, inspired mm -hmm. on the 
ex votos uh, of Mexico City, of the, I'm sorry, of the Mexican culture, and on the um, ex votos as well of the of Greek culture. There's, they're called Tamana. They will be displayed connecting two buildings. Uh, also my new studio uh, that Alberto designed. Uh, I think I have one month before I can move in there. Very excited about that. Uh, doing a residency in Greece. And um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm exploring uh, the Panthers, uh, the, the, the path of the Panther, immersing myself with my immediate culture and making sure that we know that we live among the Panthers mm -hmm. right next door in the Everglades. And we have a beautiful uh, swamp sunflowers that exist as beautiful sunflowers at the south of France. And we should start visiting and promoting more often things that are right behind our backyard, mm -hmm. owning these things uh, uh, that are immediate. You and I talk a lot about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, locally we should focus a lot of our education system into local culture instead of national news, uh, sorry, national themes. We have to know what's around us so we can understand who we are too, so it can activate us. Um, working with that and uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm looking at Alberto over here. <laughs> also want to say hello, he's reminding me. What it's I'm a list doing. of all the things you you're going Over to do your face here i don't know there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's the other half that makes uh the other half that makes it all happen makes well happen. this is Thank really you. i think well, this has been wonderful i hope everybody has enjoyed it as much as i have and um uh we're going to bring you back again to talk about another subject where we can talk about the objects that could be next. Okay. I, I will enjoy <laughs> we can that. talk about the object. We channel uh, chapter two. So I see that um, there are a couple of questions. Paul, are you still there? Do you want to do the questions? Okay. There's a question from A. Johansson. Uh, when you think about the Taino and the West African peoples brought to the Americas, as you are creating, do you imagine these cultures speaking to each other? Can you share some of the things you think they are saying to each other? Meaning the, uh, Paul, the, the uh, indigenous uh, people and the Western African? I think that's what he meant, yes. Uh, what I imagine uh, is the music they created, the sounds that they created. Uh, yes, to answer your question, yes, I do. I go to those places. In a way, uh, some of the things I wrote to Bartolome is like, how do you survive witnessing so much pain and the horrors? I mean, we didn't, we don't have time, but if I read you some of the things that are in here, I would have died of sadness, no? Uh, but by the way, Bartolome talks about Florida in here. For those of you that are from Florida, if you wanna know more about it as well. Um, I, I also, um, in a way, uh, as, as hard as I think about this, is I, 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 I wanted to witness the culture itself, take aside all the, 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 the horrors that he witnessed. I, I would have liked physically see how these people live. The word Taino is not actually, it's not the name of their tribe. Taino means I'm good. The Taino people use that word to the fearings, the fearings, I don't know how to pronounce that word, here comes my English, to, to make themselves different from the Carib Indians that were killing and literally eating people. Distinguish so they, themselves. They, exactly, they told the people, I'm good, I'm good. And most accounts write about the, 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 the noble qualities of the Taino and and in a way, like, like, like the question asked, it's like, I, yes, I, I want to see that. When I go to our land in Puerto Rico, I so many times, Albert and I, and some of the guests that we take, sometimes that place is loaded with fireflies. When, you, when we go swimming to the, to, the, to the ponds, to the waterfalls at night, and I imagine what this uh, fireflies must have meant to the Taino people. Uh, uh, they saw them as God, beauties, uh, uh, guides, uh, fairies. Uh, I wonder many, many times because they were in that land. And mm -hmm. I, we still have thousands of fireflies at night 
you can only imagine how many fireflies 500 years ago. Mm. I think most artists, we romanticize about these things, but they must have been a romantic Taino or so around there. And I can help it. I come from, from that romantic cultures, you know? Okay. So we have another question here from Arthur Dunkelman. You've mentioned him a few times in the talk. He's the curator of the Kislak Cent uh, collection at University of Miami. Uh, Carlos asks, he says, thank you, Carlos, and I'm sorry, Arthur writes, thank you, Carlos and Carol, for a deep dive into the mind and work of a creative artist. How have you brought this work back to Puerto Rico? And there's a follow-up question. Is there a permanent presence for your work in your hometown? Uh, thank you, Arthur, first of all, because uh, you did not hesitate to understand my passion and love and you move everything so I could have uh, the back door at the case like back then at the at Miami Lakes. And I'll never forget going with Clyde Butcher. You took Albert and I and we went on that hike underwater surrounded by alligators. Uh, beautiful to really, again, touch and feel the presence. Um, yes, there's, a, there's some of my work it's in Puerto Rico. Did I understand the, the question properly? Is there a poll? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, and yeah, uh, I was very specifically very, your your hometown. Yes, in Puerto I, Rico. I was very very fortunate to have a retrospective in 2015. You can see it online and in my uh, in my website as well. And uh, were many many. I mean, it was. Uh, I think I had seven gallery rooms in the museum. And one of the rooms uh, was dedicated to a lot of this work. A lot of these vinyls are large. They were part of the exhibit. Some of these work are in permanent collections in Puerto Rico. It's very important to me uh, to have that relationship with, with, with a country I was born into. It exists there. I, actually, the, the exhibit, uh, I say this very humbly, but I was moved because, you know, I'm, I'm just an artist from an island and sometimes we get easily dismissed. It was uh, for our forum, it was critics pick for the month. It was the, mm -hmm. the pick, the, the best exhibit of the month among all the exhibits in, uh, in our forum when it was exhibited. And I was honored with that, uh, with that write-up. It's a beautiful write-up that our forum did on it. I think uh, Klaus, uh, Klaus Bissenbacher, the curator of, no, I think I know Klaus Bissenbacher. The, he was the curator of, at MoMA back then, he uh, wrote about it as well in his Instagram. It had a precedent. It had a precedence, and I was most grateful and to 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 do that because for an artist, it's the continuity. You need to have that connection. Yes, it's an exhibit, but I need this work to go back. No, and uh, so thank you for that question. I hope I, I answer it properly. And on that note, I think we're ready to close the program down. I want to thank you both for a great conversation. And I want to thank all of you who participated by watching the program and helped energize it. Carol, Carlos, have a great evening. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Gracias. Bye -bye. Gracias. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. -bye.